Thank you for all coming tonight. Uh, we're happy to have with us tonight Des Moines Register columnist, Mr. Donald Call. Mr. Call has written the Des Moines Register column over the coffee for the past seven years. In 1970, he compiled what he considered to be his best columns in a book, How to Light a Water Heater and Other War Stories. A year ago, he was transferred, transferred from Des Moines to, Washington, to the Washington Bureau of the Des Moines Register and Tribune and is currently living in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to present to you Des Moines Register columnist, Mr. Donald Call. No, that, that really is not doing much, is it? Is that doing anything? Can all of you who want to hear me, hear me? <laughs> is there anyone with problem? <laughs> Besides that, I mean, <laughs> hearing. Everyone's got a problem. So, somehow I'd expected a more intimate gathering, somehow. <laughs> Although if we get more people in here, I suppose it will be an intimate gathering. <laughs> uh, I feel somewhat uh, under an obligation to address myself, at least in part, to freshmen, since I was brought here by the freshmen. And uh, really, I think we, we owe it to them anyway, since freshmen can't help being freshmen. Indeed, indeed, most of them are bending every effort to improve their condition. And I was a freshman myself once. Actually, I was a freshman twice. Uh, <laughs> I was a freshman in 1951 and 52 and 53. <laughs> I remember that because I became, not, not all of 53, because I became a sophomore in 53 and remained a sophomore until just before Eisenhower's second inauguration <laughs> in 57, <laughs> when I became a senior. <laughs> Three years later, I graduated, which gives you a kind of idea of, you know, the way I went through, uh, uh, through college. But I, I've, I've always thought as a freshman, as a, as a useful, instrument in society. He, he performs something of the same function that Cistercian monks do. <laughs> I remember staying up at New Mellory Abbey, uh, a monastery near, near Dubuque, uh, 10 years ago, I suppose it is uh, uh, now, and it, it, it was a you know, thrilling experience. It's, it's, a great, it's a great deal of uh, fun talking to the, to the monks. Uh, they, they don't talk back much, but, but but it's, it's, you, know, you can have a, a good time doing it. It was interesting, and the thing that I got out of it was that the monks considered themselves kind of conduits for, for divine grace to, to be channeled to earth through the prayers of man, the, their, their prayers. And, and in much the same way, I think that uh, Freshmen exist in society as receptacles of unwanted advice. <laughs> I mean, surely those of you who are freshmen or have been freshmen realize that almost anyone on the street, a professor, a parent, a gardener, a cab driver, is willing to give you advice. You tell them you're a freshman, say, ah, if I knew now what I knew, if I knew then what I knew now, <laughs> and you wind up asking him, you know, or, or what is it you've learned all these years that you can tell me? And he says, a stitch in time saves nine. <laughs> well, I'm not going to give you advice. What I'd like to do is to give a little background on myself, and you can you can draw lessons from it or not draw lessons from it as you choose to. And anyway, you'll know who you'll be talking to. And then at the conclusion of that, uh, throw the thing open uh, to questions, uh, if any. And uh, let me begin by saying something about my, my uh, early background. Growing up on the near west side of Detroit, 
uh, where we did not tell Polish jokes. We lived them. <laughs> and the intellectuals in our Polish neighborhood were those among us who read classic comics, quite literally. Now, not much of us was expected of us in school. You know, I'll never, I'll never forget the first day of of, uh, of class when the teacher had us, uh, oh, you know, practicing tying shoes and, and buttoning and getting the string strung through your mittens on your, and that was high school. <laughs> now, the last thing anybody expected out of us in that particular school was to be a writer. I think of the school had ever turned out a writer. We'd had a couple of kids with good handwriting, but you know, that was <laughs> as, as close as we came. And I remember one time when they sent out a questionnaire asking the kids if they spoke a foreign language at home. And 40% of them answered, yes, English. I'm trying to impress you. with a proposition that the atmosphere I grew up in, in that Polish neighborhood in Detroit, was not that of a New England prep school. And when I, I graduated from it in the top 10% of my class, which was no big deal, believe me, if you saw the bottom 90% of my class, uh, I was somewhat at a loss as, as, as to what I wanted to be when I grew up. And we didn't have a career counselor at, at the school. And I, uh, I don't think anyone, from, anyone had ever graduated from the school and gone on to a career, for, uh, for that matter. So I went to my father and discussed the idea of what I should do. And he suggested that I become a dentist, a prospect which filled me with loathing. I mean, the whole idea of life being one oral cavity after another just <laughs> it set my teeth on edge is what it did <laughs> not gonna be any questions you're gonna rush the stage <laughs> but anyway I, I talked to uh, uh, so I said what's what's your ne next best offer and he, and he offered engineering as being a pretty good wages an hour kind of kind of uh, pr profession, and is giving, uh, you know, the most return for the money. And since it was his money, I agreed to become an engineer. Now, in retrospect, the, the idea of me becoming an engineer is droll to the point of insanity. And I'm the, really the kind of person who uh, asks for a book of instructions when he buys a screwdriver. And I, I, when I graduated from high school, I was under the impression that manual training was the president of Mexico. <laughs> but I figured that anything that didn't involve looking into other people's mouths for a living couldn't be all bad. I was wrong, of course. As it turned out, it was all bad. I had certain conceptual problems which kept me from great success as an engineer. Like, for example, I couldn't figure out why the inches on a slide wheel weren't the same length. <laughs> I remember a particular early experience in shop where we were uh, mastering the lathe, as I remember. And the first project of shop was to take a cylinder of metal put it on this lathe, which for those of you who don't know is a whirly thing that goes around. <laughs> and I was to make a cone out of this cylinder of metal to fantastic tolerances, less than a quarter of an inch. I mean, you really had to be accurate. <laughs> well, you know, I worked around with it and uh, I thought I had it one, one day, but uh, he said I put the point on the wrong end and <laughs> then I put points on two ends. One day I made a, a sphere out of the cylinder, which the instructor thought was quite remarkable. He'd never seen that done before on a lathe. But I wasn't getting any closer to my goal. 
So finally, he said to me, uh, Call, you know, you've ruined about 25 pieces of metal. <laughs> this is in about, you know, the 12th week when everyone else is knitting stoves out of steel wool, you know. <laughs> and he says, you, You're going to have to sh uh, uh, shape up or ship out. So I shipped out. I wasn't. <laughs> I, wanted, I, I grew up in a Polish neighborhood, but I wasn't dumb by any means. <laughs> and I, but I continued with engineering just out of a, a sense of um, uh, not knowing uh, anything else to do. You know, it was either continue with engineering or get a job as far as I was uh, 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 concerned. Well, my life changed when I took a course called Engineering English, which I'm Sure, you can tell something of by its title. It's not like regular English, you know. It's like English, English for people who are caught up in the lyricism of I-beam construction. And I studied for my exams that year, my engineering exams, not merely the English, but all my engineering exams, exclusively by reading a series of short comic novels by Max Schulman. I had almost given up, you see. And uh, this didn't do much for my engineering drawing 101 uh, grade. But in engineering English, it inspired me to write my final as a series of short comic stories by Max Schulman, <laughs> which flipped my English teacher out. I mean, he'd been teaching engineers English all these years, and here he had a live one, man, a guy who was trying to be funny on purpose. <laughs> well, he gave me an A. The very first I got in engineering school. As it turned out, the last. I went to... Uh, the whole world opened up for me at this point. I, I, it suddenly uh, occurred to me that instead of uh, uh, wrestling slide rules and things like that, I could go into lit school. And uh, I don't know what I uh, didn't know what I was going to do with a lit school education, but at least I might not flunk out of school. You know, you sit there and you write some funny finals, and they give you an A, and it's kind of uh, uh, pleasant as opposed to what engineering had been uh, for me. Well, as it turned out, I didn't have. My grades weren't, uh, weren't good enough to be accepted by the lit school. So they put me on what the University of Michigan had uh, called at the time a conditional transitional program, <laughs> which will be very rational to those of you familiar with college administration. Uh, administratively, I stayed in the engineering department. But I took all lit school courses. Well, I set an inter intercollegiate record for consecutive semesters on the conditional transitional <laughs> program. Because while I did better, I did not do great. So what happened was that the lit school couldn't throw me out because my records were in the engineering department. Engineering school didn't throw me out because what did they care? I was flunking lit school courses now. <laughs> Finally, somebody stepped on my IBM card with a golf shoe or something and they, they discovered me and flunked me out of school. <laughs> Which led me to the traumatic experience of getting a job armed only with my Polish high school education and some rather ill-defined English and engineering training. Well, I got a job as a chip man in a ball bearing factory. <laughs> I'll wager there are those among you who don't know what a chip man in a ball bearing factory does. I'll describe it briefly. A, uh, a a uh, ball bearing factory is filled with screw machines, which is nothing more really than my old nemesis, the lathe. <laughs> Takes pieces of metal and goes whirly around them and makes balls and bearings. 
uh, out of them and drops the shavings into an oil bath. The chip man goes around with a big leaden wagon on wheels. He scrapes the shavings out of this oil bath, puts them into the uh, wagon he's carrying. He, carries, he wheels this over to a centrifuge, dumps it in, whirls it around, Re makes a giant Brillo pad out of the shavings <laughs> and recovers the oil. He then dumps the Brillo pad outside and puts the oil back in the machine. He does that for eight hours a day. And I did that from 11 p.m. until 7 a.m. for about four or five months. And I found it an enormous educational experience. It taught me I didn't want to be a chip man the rest of my <laughs> life. And that's, it more, that's more than seven semesters on the conditional transitional program had managed to do. So I talked my way back into school and I prospered, even graduated eventually, and uh, went on to graduate school which uh, was kind of a, a giggle considering my mark, and I uh, got a master's. And it, my, you know, my college career reminds me a great deal of the, the title by, I think it was Robert Benchney, my 10 years in a quandary and how they grew. But I think there's a lesson in this for all of you, young and old alike. And this is a lesson, you never know. And there I was, a kid from Detroit, growing up, being taught that English was a hard subject. I thought Iowa was the capital of Idaho. <laughs> Maybe the other way around. And I could have become a bad dentist, miserable engineer, a competent chip man. <laughs> but instead I became an English major which was not all that easy because my family didn't, you know, like I was the first guy in my, in my family to go to college. They couldn't really relate to an English major. They say, yeah, but what, what, what are you going to be when you grow up, you know? <laughs> well, now I'm, I wish I could beat them now, those same people, because I, I, I know what I tell them. I'd say that I'm not going to grow up. <laughs> I'm going to be an English major for the rest of my life. But then again, you never know. Thank you. Now ask me anything on any subject, even the occult. Yes. Do I like Washington, D.C.? Yeah, I really like Washington, D.C. I make, uh, you know, I make my living. What happened? Become an intimate gathering again. I make, uh, I make my living uh, making fun of nonsense, and, and Washington has more nonsense per square yard than <laughs> Ringling Brothers, you know. And, and there's no winter. <laughs> That's nice. Yes? Compare Washington to Des Moines with respect to nonsense. Uh, Washington is like having the girls' basketball tournament in town all the time. says that 
some of us have the uh, theory that uh, Nixon chose Agnew for his vice president because he didn't want to be impeached, which is kind of the cleaned up version of that, uh, of that joke. Um, what do I think of that? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm starting. Uh, the, uh, I'm starting to. Uh, you know, the, the original theory was, you know, it would make him uh, uh, look good to have a klutz like, uh, <laughs> like Agnew. But I don't know. The more I look at Nixon, the better Agnew is beginning to look to me. <laughs> How did I find Ames? As always, with great difficulty, <laughs> I, uh, I, I happen to uh, borrow a Volkswagen bus, and I think uh, that's their revenge for losing World War II, as nearly as I can uh, tell. I was, uh, the, the, the wind is really somewhat, I was drafting behind a double-bottomed uh, truck, and every time I tried to, uh, to pass them, uh, the wind would just start blowing me uh, uh, back to Des Moines. So I, it wasn't direction this time, but it was kind of a hairy trip uh, for me. I don't have a Studebaker, dear. I have a checker. <laughs> well, it's two days from Washington is why, you know, <laughs> two days back. I mean, I like the checker, but driving across the United States from Washington to Iowa isn't my idea of a good time. No, the damn thing won't get fixed. I've, I've really, you know, worked on my temperature gauge very, uh, very uh, assiduously. And in fact, my speedometer stopped working now. <laughs> I have this great car. Everything works on it except the indicators of what's not working. <laughs> you, you, you get in it and you think it's a disaster, and it just hums along. You know, no oil pressure. The temperature's <laughs> 250. The speedometer's on zero. It was too good to be true. Yes. He's asking me to compare the, the humorous quality of the nonsense in Washington as against the humorous quality of the, of the nonsense in Iowa. Some, he says some of the nonsense in Washington isn't very funny. Well, all right. Uh, but that's basically my problem, to try and see the humor in, in what, you know, is, is, can, can be a very serious uh, uh, situation. You know, I was in Iowa for 12 years. I, mean, uh, I wrote the column full time for seven. I wrote the column on part-time basis, I think for three years before that. It adds up to something, something on the order of 2,000 columns written in Iowa. Well, that's a lot of columns to be funny about Iowa. And I, I, I sort of was, thought it was a good time for me to move on. And uh, Washington may, may not be the place uh, uh, may, may not be the place I finally stay because uh, it's an insulated society. You know, everyone in, in, uh, in Washington, there, there are no factories in Washington. I mean zero factories. This big place, there's no factories. You don't have any of the kinds of faces that come out of factories. You have nothing but paper shufflers who, uh, who work there. And it gives a kind of eerie quality to the, it looks like an Antonioni movie or something sometimes, you know. Everybody, it's, it's so homo, homogeneous. Uh, really, there are two kinds of people there. There are black people and, uh, and uh, white people. And that's, that's, uh, that's it. Basically, the, uh, there's a large middle class black population there. But uh, there are many uh, poor blacks uh, there. And they're cheap labor for the, uh, for the middle class whites. It's really kind of not, not the most pleasant society in the, uh, uh, in the world. Uh, but right there is where the action is happening. I'm going to try and syndicate a column in the next few months. And uh, it's probably easier to, to do it there from there than someplace else, which is why I'm there. I may move. Yeah. Boy, I, you know, 
Well, it's hard to, it's hard to hold that position when you don't really believe in God. Um, not that I just believe in God, you understand. It's just I'm undecided. I'm always at 14% in the poll that are, that's, uh, that's undecided. But uh, yeah, I would, I would hope that our prayers had something to do, if there is a God, that George Allen, who is uh, perhaps the most obnoxious uh, man in American public life, save one. Uh, what, what he is, he is the football player's Nixon, is what, is what he is. He, he, he embodies all the qualities uh, about w Richard Nixon on a much smaller uh, scale. Yeah. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> I, I didn't hear the last part. Well, I see a lot more men who look as though their mother dressed him. <laughs> and, you know, seriously though, you see these biggies close up and uh, they have a lot of people taking care of them. Uh, they can look any way pretty much they, they want to. They have expensive, well-cut suits, their shoes are always polished right to there and they never have a worn down heel and people just people just flood in front of them parting the uh, parting the waves so if you saw Nixon in the flesh so to speak <laughs> he'd look different to you from the way you you uh, you think he looks uh, uh, right now well the ticking, for example. <laughs> he looks very artificial, actually. He's got kind of a big head on a, on a little body, and he's always got <laughs> pancake makeup on, <laughs> or, or a good tan. Uh, and he looks, it's a little the effect that uh, a well-made-up corpse has. <laughs> Uh, and I don't say that pejoratively, but but uh, in, 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 you know he, he just doesn't really quite look real uh, to you, not to me at least. Well, Agno, on the other hand, looks very real. Yeah, I would hope to. Yeah, I, I, he asked me if I'm going to take another trip. Uh, uh, across I Iowa, I, I would I would hope to do so on a bike. As a matter of fact, this uh, uh, this spring and being uh, being in Iowa several times and maintain better contact uh, with the state because you really kind of miss those little Iowa uh, uh, towns, uh, gaudy Humboldt on the weekend, things like that. <laughs> yes. Well, you can hardly help it. One way or one way or the other, they'll make it home. You know, I'm going east or west. Uh, well, most of them will make it home. Let's put it that way. There'll be some, perhaps, uh, who will suffer a a uh, uh, a sad fate. I don't know. You know that 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 really. Uh, my my friend, uh, in a colleague of mine, is the place where I got most of the anecdotes for that National Guard story. Uh, I wrote, and they're, and they're all true, you know, uh, as most of us who have served in the National Guard of one kind or another uh, uh, know. I remember I served in a, a, a naval, not, not a National Guard, but a naval reserve unit uh, when I was staying out of the Korean War. <laughs> and I was at the University of Michigan, and uh, we had nothing but, you know, college students, PhDs, former officers, and it was the most screwed up unit. And well, it, it made the, uh, the Nation Iowa National Guard look like the, uh, the Marine Corps band. Uh, the, uh, the commandant of the 9th Naval District came, came to review us once. And uh, I had my stripes sewn on the wrong way. 
Uh, I mean, I forget which way they go. If, if they're supposed to go on this way, well, mine were going on that way because I sewed them on myself. I was going to do something about it, but I never got around to it. <laughs> so we had this big inspection with the commandant of the 9th Naval Dis District, who's an admiral, you know, a big deal, and all the PhDs were sitting on it. And he walks and reviews us. He never noticed. My, everyone else's stripes were going this way, and mine were going that way. So I lost all respect for the organization. <laughs> that was... Uh, that was the meeting at which the kid who uh, didn't have black shoes, so he wore blue suede shoes with his, uh, with his Navy uniform, fainted. And it was wild, you know, because here we are, basically, you know, college guys, and we're worried about this comrade of ours that fainted. But we're also very aware that the Commandant of the 9th Naval District is, is in the room and that we should be good soldiers and ignore this poor slob lying on the, uh, on the floor like those pictures you see of the Buckingham Palace uh, a guard one always uh, passes out. So we stood there you know, for 20 minutes while the commandant of the 9th Naval District uh, passed uh, among us before we picked up uh, this kid who had, uh, uh, who had uh, uh, fainted, which shows what the military can do to you even when it's inept. The military can do to you even when it's inept. Yes? Who's really running the country? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, but I think a hint. You gotta, you gotta have a, you know, there's gotta be a clue there when you see a guy like, uh, like Roy Ash, who uh, jacks up the price of the uh, <laughs> of of uh, the airplanes he's he's uh, or, or ships he's making for us, costs the company uh, the government hundreds of millions of dollars in extras, and then is rewarded for this efficiency by being made bureau of the budget. Well, there's got to be a clue somewhere in there as to who is running the country. Uh, it ain't welfare mothers. You know, I, 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 I've been kind of uh, involved in getting together a, uh, a bike group in, in uh, D.C. Because, boy, it's really rugged there. I mean, the cars, they go at you. <laughs> and we talked to the National Parks uh, Guy, you know, they, they, they have a Rock Creek Park, which is a national park, and everybody uses it in their cars to commute to work, and you can't use it on a bicycle because you get killed by the car. So we were trying to get some bike paths in there, and, and, uh, and he, uh, he said, there's just no money for bike paths. And I said, well, ki kick the cars out of there. And he says, well, if, you, if you stopped, if you stopped the people coming through that, uh, coming through that uh, park, and interviewed them, you'd find that was the most, the single most powerful road lobby in the United States. Because, you know, there's about 30 congressmen and 14 uh, uh, senators, and uh, they, they just ain't about to have uh, their park uh, uh, taken away from them. Which, which suggested to me an, uh, an idea which uh, I'd had several years before, almost frivolously, but would really be pretty good. That's the institution of a national bikes, bicycle association and have the leader be designated the bicycle bag man. And it'd be his job 
to go uh, collect money, to collect money, be, be the repository of the money from the bicyclists all around the country, and then go and bribe politicians. <laughs> now, that's, that's the way it's done. You know, Litton Industries, uh, when they want something, they don't get a lot of people out and, and have a mass march on the Capitol and scream and have speeches. They send one guy. <laughs> but he's got pockets. <laughs> I think it w you could work it like this, you know. You dress it up a little. Maybe you don't call him a bag man. Maybe you call him the political funding consultant. The way it would work here, you could even do it on a local level. You get, well, how many bike, bicyclists can you get together, say here in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, <laughs> that bad, huh? Say 500 <laughs> in Des Moines, and uh, we had a thousand out that you know bike day. We say 500 willing to give a dollar a piece. And you got $500, and you go to Neil Smith. <laughs> now, Neil Smith is going to win his election, but he's worried about it, right? And you say, Mr. Smith, I'm the uh, bicycle funding uh, consultant, and uh, I was just wondering what your position on uh, bicycling is. Now, if the truth were known, Neil Smith doesn't have a position on bicycling. But he's not going to tell you that, and I don't say that out of any, I think, you know, Smith is a, is a good congressman, but he's a congressman. He's going to blow a little smoke in your ear. He's going to say, well, I just think bicycling is one of the great things, and we need an awful lot. <laughs> we, we, we need an awful lot more of it, and it's just too bad about those cars. <laughs> and you say, that's what I wanted to hear. Here's $500 for your campaign. Well, you know, he'll find out the check doesn't bounce. Then when you see Congress, something comes up about bicycles. You haven't bought him exactly, but he's going to say, now wait a minute, we, we, uh, we maybe uh, could do something for the bicyclists. They're kind of nice folk, actually. <laughs> Ecology and all that. Well, you could do that. You know, we're, say, we're, we're, we're getting twenty or $30,000 and getting federal, you know, and buying three miles of bike path and getting the federal funds to match it. Every dollar spent politically to bribe a uh, public official will come back 15-fold the following year. I really think we should get together and try and uh, uh, start operating on, on that level because uh, I'm really tired of throwing my body in front of, in front of cars on my bicycle. You, you guys have it pretty good here, don't you, really? At least you've got some places, I, you know. Uh, it's tough. There's nothing in Des Moines. <laughs> I have a bicycle that cost me five hundred dollars. <laughs> I am not going to ride over a curb on a bicycle that cost me five hundred dollars. It's for sale, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, uh, you know, it was like, it was, it's the Ferrari of bicycles, you know. I got a Mossy. And I said, I deserve no less, right? <laughs> Where else can you go, you know, really first class with a, with a transportation machine for $500? You tell a guy, I bought a car for $500. And he said, well, what a junk. You tell him I bought a bike for five hundred dollars. You must be out of your mind. <laughs> but uh, I've come to the point where I'd like the five hundred dollars better than the Ferrari. So if uh, anybody have uh, five C's there and want to uh, <laughs> unload uh, unload them on a bicycle or a nice bike, uh, see me afterwards. Yeah.
Uh, do I ever write contrary to my personal beliefs uh, just to exploit a uh, humorous situa situation? Uh, not really, but boy, I come close. Um, I really write a hell of a lot more about girls' basketball than I feel about girls' basketball, uh, just between uh, the few of us uh, uh, here. I remember when, uh, hmm, he's back, the sound of music when it came to, uh, to Des Moines. It so happened, I just moved in a new house. And one of the things I really liked about that house was that it was two blocks away from the Capri Theater. So I could walk down and uh, see any movie I wanted to see. And they were having good movies. And The Sound of Music came to the Capri. And it was there two and a half years. <laughs> before I managed to drive it out with my biting criticism. But during those two and a half years, I, I, at first I took it as a personal affront. I thought they were out to get me. Uh, but uh, during those two and a half years, I, it was kind of expected of me to write about the sound of music every once in a while. And I, I, every, every time I'd write about it, I'd say, well, that's it. I'm not going to write any more, more about that dog. And then something would happen, and I couldn't resist another zinger. And <laughs> so. So people really thought I was uh, bonkers uh, against the uh, sound of music when really it was uh, not that a big, big a, a deal after I got over the initial shock and realized it was going to take a while to drive it out of town. <laughs> Although it's back. <laughs> yes? What suggestions do I have for the improvement of the Iowa legislature? Make it smaller. I mean... Uh, you can't, you can't hurt anything by making it, uh, uh, making it smaller. Actually, you know, I kid about the Iowa legislature a lot, more, more than uh, it deserves. You ain't seen nothing until you've seen the Maryland legislature. <laughs> or that, I, I don't know if it's been in the paper yet or not, a clown up in, uh, in Wisconsin, a state senator who was arguing that, uh, that um, uh, contraceptives was hurting uh, the war effort because uh, <laughs> poor people would stop having children and you couldn't recruit an army without poor people's children. <laughs> That's Wisconsin. <laughs> as loony as the Iowa legislature is, it's better than most legislatures and, and uh, it's much more honest. You can either buy Iowa legislator with a ham sandwich or you can't buy them at all. <laughs> Has L.B. Liddy missed me? Who's L.B. Liddy? <laughs> no, I don't know whether L.B. has missed me. I know some people miss me. I got a nice note from Jack Woods, the Des Moines City <laughs> Councilman, the other, uh, the other day, which was nice because it was spelled well and everything. <laughs> and uh, I tell you who I miss. I miss Dick Turner. Uh, I'm really so I was really quite so uh, sorry to hear you know, he had a heart attack uh, uh, last week. I'm going to send him a... Uh, I want to send him a, a note saying get well quick because the column is uh, harder to write with you off the job than on. And he's a nice man anyway. Yes. What do you want me to say about Big Sh Bill Shirley? <laughs> uh, Bill Shirley, uh, I'm glad he's in, in, uh, in Congress uh, because he makes good copy. And he doesn't do much else, but he makes good copy. He's got a good PR guy, and uh, and he's got, uh, actually though he's got uh, he's got uh, he personally even spontaneously he's got a a flair for saying uh, a bright direct thing. For example, on the other day, uh, he came out saying that uh, uh, the uh, administration was going to put uh, price ceilings on raw agricultural materials, and Wiley, Maine came out and said, no, they're not either. And so the White House did. And we came back to Shirley and asked him, well, what about Wiley, Maine? 
uh, contradicting you on this. He says, ah, uh, Maine's always a day late and a dollar short. Uh, that's, you know, you don't get that from, uh, from Neil Smith, who was an infinitely uh, superior uh, congressman uh, uh, to Mr. Shirley. Actually, we have, you know, you look at the Iowa congressional delegation, totally, that's better than most. That's what you have to say for, which may be sad for the whole nation, but, <laughs> but it's better than most. When am I going to hold my next contest? I don't know. The last one was pretty, uh, pretty successful in terms of, uh, of the number of ent entries, and I, I, uh, I wasn't enthralled by the quality of the, uh, uh, of the entries. So I, I don't know. Uh, a, 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 a contest is kind of hard. Sometimes it catches on. Sometimes it doesn't. And then you have to read the damn things when they come in, you know, and that's, uh, that's all. You know, sometimes that, that becomes a, a chore. The reason you, you, you run contests anyway, uh, let me say it frankly, is so you don't have to write a real column. And when the work of running a contest becomes greater than writing the real column, you know, you're, you're up against it. Yeah. Uh, let me go to Gross first and then the young lady. What do I think of H.R. Gross? I think every uh, deliberative body of uh, more than 400 people should have one H.R. Gross in it. I'm just sorry he's from Iowa, that's all. <laughs> well, he's, you know, he sits there and he, he attends all the meetings and he, uh, he, uh, uh, he fly specs and crosses the T's and, uh, and he'll save you $20,000, $30,000 uh, uh, every once in a while to point out some idiocy. Uh, in uh, in some law because he does his homework and it's nice to have one guy like that you don't need any more but uh, it's nice to have one and again he's a character you know very he really he, it's hard to imagine him from another state maybe someplace maybe someplace up in New York you, you know you see Gross and he's there with a pitchfork right, right. <laughs> yeah Mr. Yes. Five best and five worst movies last year. Well, I just have to sit down on a list of of, of uh, movies that I uh, uh, that I've seen. I, 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 I and I don't know which movies get here. Um, <laughs> that was always a problem, as as I remember. Uh, has a film called Salaman La Salamandra been here? Well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> My uncle Antoine's a nice uh, uh, movie. Nothing, right? Uh, the good movies are not coming into Iowa, and they never and they never have. And the reason is, when they come, they die. I've you know talked movie owners into bringing good movies into Des Moines, and only on rare occasions did they ever make a buck uh, out of them. People, uh, they're harder. Yeah, even some some of them, you know, I, I've I've praised films like uh, Claire's Knee. It's a very difficult film. Uh, if you like that kind of film, it's a great film, but it's a slow, talky film. You know, people just stay away from that. They don't want to be bothered when they go to a movie uh, uh, theater. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Last Tango uh, in Paris now, which you should be in town uh, uh, pretty soon. But there are an awful lot of good films around now. But uh, how many of them will come to Iowa, I have no idea. You know, don't you have a film society or something that brings these films at least the next year or two years, two years after? That's what these, you know, that's what film societies are supposed to do. It's a shame they don't. Yeah. Like, well, I, said, I wrote a column uh, to, to the effect that, uh, again, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was uh, uh, kind, of, kind of the... Uh, uh, as an article, we accepted his malevolence as an article of faith, and 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 we so feared J. Edgar Hoover, and we didn't realize that uh, uh, an L. Patrick Gray fronting for Richard Nixon might indeed be much more dangerous than uh, than uh, a J. Edgar Hoover who had his own power base and a certain kind of integ integrity, at least, where. Uh, <coughs> Gray is just an office boy, as nearly as I can uh, tell. 
I mean, he sends out his agents to investigate the Watergate, and the people call his agents back, so connected with the committee to reelect the, uh, the president, and give co confidential testimony. And within 48 hours, the White House is on the phone chewing out those people for giving the confidential sec uh, uh, testimony. That's just unconscionable, it seems to me. Uh, <coughs> Gray admits all this as though there were nothing wrong with it, which is a technique of the Nixon administration any anyway. <coughs> they just, you know, it's, it's kind of government by announcement. <laughs> the crime, uh, the crime problem is all over. The, the crisis is ended. You can, you can stop hiding in your houses. Come on out now. You know, you come out of your house, you still get beat up, but uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the tone, it's a, you know, it's a government by public relations. I think if you look at the men around him, his, um, his thugs, his palace guard, <coughs> many of them <coughs> were with, uh, in public relations. You know, which seems to me uh, exactly the wrong place to try and uh, get a government uh, uh, started. Nixon's a uh, difficult man to deal with, though. He's, uh, he's much smarter than I, ever, uh, than I ever gave him credit for. He's always showing you something in the left hand, and you know, you're getting all excited about what he's showing you in the left hand. You're mad about it. You're in favor of it. You're arguing about it. Really, he's doing it to you with the right hand all the time. You take this, uh, this issue of aid to North Vietnam. Well, you know, everybody, we should, we shouldn't. My God, that's what we did after World War II. <coughs> Terrible murderer. I don't think he has any intention of giving aid to North Vietnam. I think that Richard Nixon did, did what we all wanted to do all these years, or so many of us wanted him to do all these years. He got the hell out of South Vietnam. And he's going to let him fight it out. And uh, if the North Vietnamese uh, give him a hard time, then he can say, all right, you violated the truce. I'm not going to give you any aid. So they never had any aid in the first place. You know, what, what, is he, uh, what is he taking away from them? But at least he gives him uh, uh, f some, some room to, uh, to, to respond to something without having to make an overt uh, act. And he's really clever at that game. Boy, he, he invented it. It's not his cleverness that counts there. It's, it's, the, it's the cleverness, I think, of the uh, Norwegians. And I, I just would not think that, uh, that he gets a Nobel Prize, no. Tito, I understand, has uh, been nominated by, uh, uh, by his government for the Nobel Prize. He might, uh, he might make it. Mm -hmm. What is Nixon's new stand on boycotts and people power? Oh, I mean, well, I, I, I still don't, don't know what his, what his uh, stand is. Was it in a press conference the other day? Yeah, I, 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 like, I like the guy who said, uh, why don't you pray for lower prices? Uh, then there was let them eat cheese, uh, uh, Arthur Burns. Actually, you know, I'm not, I'm, this, I'm not so much against this. You, you can make this inflation stuff uh, work for you. At least in the middle class, if you you know if you're really up against it uh, poor, then, then you know if you you always get you always get shafted. But uh, we we you know we've become a tremendously wasteful, uh, uncaring society, and I think the uh, the uh, a thing like inflation, a thing like the so-called energy crisis, makes us uh, uh, look at things in a more conservative way, conserving. Uh, way and maybe you know I'm going around now thinking of ways to uh, save nickels and dimes that I wasn't doing uh, uh, a year ago, and that's good. You know, you, you live cleaner, you live leaner uh, uh, that way. So there is a good side to this, but uh, uh, basically it's the poor guys who who get it in the neck. Good for it. I don't think boycotts and anything that's going to do any good. No, but you know he's a very clever man. I, I, am I afraid that Henry Kissinger will start writing a column 
No, but Kissinger is a clever, uh, a clever man. It's 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 hard to imagine him in the company with those cold fish over there at the White House. Not one of them has a grain of humor uh, in them. Uh, oh, maybe a hot foot, something like that. You know, that's that's the level. But but Kissinger is truly a, a witty, cultivated man, smart man. Yeah. Is there a movement to reelect Nixon again? Well, you know, when they when they passed the uh, the, the uh, amendment, I thought that was a terrible thing, that uh, you know it was against uh, Roosevelt, and I thought people should be able to elect their president. I believe in a democracy, and they. They should be able to elect their president again and again if they so chose. However, <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to have that amendment there right now. I don't know if I, could, if I could face the future knowing that there are not only four more years, but four more years and four more years again. That, that I think thinking back, I, I can't imagine how those poor people who were who hated uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, and, and he was as hated certainly as Richard Nixon is by a large segment of the uh, uh, population, how they stood it all those uh, all those years with that man just jamming it down their throat, uh, election after uh, election. Yes. What's Nixon going to do with all the college? Oh, uh, because of his, well, he, he feels and, uh, that, that people have not made the, uh, uh, the, uh, in, the kind of um, uh, sacrifice that uh, the hid, his mother made in sending him to school. And, and uh, I, I think what, what he looks for is, uh, uh, is going to be in the, less, the next two or three years. Is going to be a, a lot easier to get cheap servants than it has been uh, 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 recently, and uh, he and his buddies will, will like that. I don't know. Is it possible to? It's not possible to work your way through school anymore, is it? Is it? Well, it, it just seems so expensive. Uh, it just seems so expensive. Now I know. I free uh, I, I freeloaded off my dad for a long time when I went to school, and then uh, my grades really didn't get good until after I'd flunked out. And he said, "Kid, I love you, but you're on your own." You know, I'd been all those semesters in college, and I had about 14 credit hours to show <laughs> for it. And then I I uh, started working and uh, and got got better grades, but I lived very well after I started working. I didn't have to scrimp and say, I bought records and you didn't, you know, I didn't make a lot of money, but uh, I didn't need a, a lot of money. It seems now it would be a hell of a lot, uh, a hell of a lot tougher. Yeah. What do I think the future will say about President Nixon? I truly don't know. You know, I, I, I often entertain the notion that I might be absolutely wrong about that man. Uh, not wrong in that I hate him. <laughs> because that's, that's a personal sort of visceral feeling. You know, you either like or dislike a person. But in that he might, you know, he's doing uh, a lot of the things that we always said should be done. Get control of the government. Uh, Bring, bring Congress to heal, cut away the bureaucracy. He's doing all that. The reason it doesn't look good to us is because he's Richard Nixon uh, doing it. We, we hardly imagine that uh, reform would come in that guise with a, with a 12 o'clock or 5 o'clock shadow. So who knows, you know, when he's done. Uh, what, uh, I, but I, I basically can't believe that that government by secrecy, that he, by manipulation, uh, sort of playing upon the fears of people rather than uh, their best instincts, I can't believe that that will work out well. I, I, I really can't. <laughs> I hope he doesn't have the room bugged. 
Yeah. <laughs> How much it was Nixon's last victory really due to Kissinger? Nixon's last victory was really due to McGovern, I'm afraid. Uh, miss, miss, it, it, it was a combination uh, uh, of things, certainly the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, but I, you know, you can't say that it was due to Kissinger as if, uh, Nixon's victory is due to Kissinger as if Nixon didn't have anything to, uh, to do with that. Uh, Kissinger is an extension of Nixon, and make no mistake about it. And for all his, uh, his brilliance and, and his negotiating uh, uh, ability, you know, Nixon is still a fellow calling the shots. Uh, personally, I, the thing I find uh, impermanent about, about Mr. Nixon's accomplishments is, is that it's still big power uh, negotiating politics that, you know, Bismarck uh, invented in 1870. Uh, and it was all right so long as Bismarck was, was around to manage Europe and it fell all, all to hell and went into World War I and then, and then later uh, uh, World War II. And I think they're still playing that, uh, that same game and they, they, they think that they can play big power politics. And, and if they're right, they're, you know, they're right. But I, I don't think that's, uh, uh, they're gonna do it. I don't think you can, uh, you can make it. But, you know, I'm 38 now, and it's amazing how, how, how ideas that everyone you knew when you were 20 or 22 or 24, everyone you knew believed in these ideas, and in 10 years they become thoroughly discredited. Now, the, the great hope when I was in college, what we all believed in was the way to get at good government was simply to find the right, well-intentioned, intelligent liberals and put them in position of power. And we all believe that. Well, if we can only get that done, the, 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 uh, the millennium would be here. And then we had Kennedy. And boy, all the academics came in, you know, and they were, sh they were not only smart, but they were tough you know, tough-minded people, the best of business and the best of the foundations and the best of the, of the uh, academics. And boy, Arthur Schlesinger was in the, was in the uh, uh, administration. And boy, we all, had, his books were required reading even before he was in the administration. It was just, you know, a great time. And those are the guys who got us in Vietnam. Make no mistake about it, they're the ones are well-intentioned, intelligent, liberals that we depended on so much. Not only got us in Vietnam, but they did it in a very uh, uh, difficult way to get, get out of uh, Vietnam. So now, the thing that everyone talks about as a savior is participatory democracy. I mean, you gotta get away from the big governments and, uh, and, and, uh, and the, the structure, and you have to get people, just real, live, people out there and, and involved in a personal level and have these town meetings on every block. That's the way we're going to save ourselves. 